And thanks for joining us. And this is going to be one of the sessions we like to do on the Cloud Exchange to highlight real progress that's happening and, and that has happened throughout the department. And as much as we've talked over the years about the challenges in migrating DoD workloads to the cloud, we, we really are at the point now where there are some big success stories to tell. And one of them is called Nautilus Virtual Desktop. There's a big push right now across the Navy to move more users into that virtual cloud-based desktop environment. But the first to go was the Navy Reserve, as they often are. And we're going to talk about several things the Reserve's been doing to modernize their IT enterprise. But I do want to start with NVD. And for this session, we're very glad to welcome two of the Navy Reserve's top IT experts with us, our Commander Stevie Greenway, the Reserve's Deputy CIO, and Lieutenant Junior Grade Christopher Gregory, the Navy Reserve's Command Technology Director. Hey, thanks to you both for doing this. I really appreciate you taking the time. And, and, and let's, let's start with NVD. Want to talk about the technology piece, the challenges you had to overcome to, to sort of implement that. But, but Commander Greenway, if you can start us off, let, let's talk about why it made sense for the Navy Reserve to go first. You have a sort of a different workforce lay down than what people tend to think of when they think of, of a military force. Talk about why that unique workforce uh, makes sense for something like this. Uh, yes, sir. First of all, thank you so much for allowing us to be on here today. And yes, the Navy Reserve, we are 60,000 strong. We are based all around the world. We have Navy Reserve centers in every single state. And every sailor that is in the Navy Reserve right now usually is either in a fleet concentrated area or in a non-fleet concentrated area. So for the sailors who are not in a fleet concentrated area, they don't have a lot of access to government computers, and devices. So the virtual desktop is a perfect opportunity for them to be able to work from their home, work to do their uh, drill weekend stuff anytime they need to via the virtual desktop, sir. And, and, and just to be clear, prior to something like this, in order to get access to government IT assets, for the most part, folks were having to physically drive into a Navy Reserve Center. Is that right? Yes, sir. And as you can imagine, you know, I used to be the commanding officer of Navy Reserve uh, Center Fargo, North Dakota. And so I'd have sailors, uh, actually one that lived in Canada, for example, would have to drive all the way in um, across the border to come, you know, make sure their computer was uh, access was, was online and they can still sign documents and everything, sir. Yes. Yeah, so we have a, a drill weekend every single month. And so for those sailors, sometimes that would be arduous due to weather, family issues. So having a virtual desktop alleviates a lot of those issues. Thank you. And I would imagine one of the things that does for you is, is sailors can do a lot of the things that they had to come in to do from home so that they're not spending their entire drill weekend um, doing IT stuff that they don't necessarily need to be there for. Yes, sir. So we were able to take and digitize a lot of the different documentation that would use uh, normally a wet signature. We could digitally sign a lot of those forms and route those uh, moving forward. And so let's talk about the IT environment it, itself. And, and Lieutenant Gregory, please feel free to jump in on this. When, when somebody logs into it, what does it actually look like? How, how, would, how does it differ, if at all, from what somebody would expect when they sat down at an, at an old school NMCI terminal? Sure, absolutely. I'd say that the beauty is it works even better and it's even faster. That's the big difference. When you log in, you have Doden like access and the Doden is the DOD information network. So it's kind of our private network. We have it closed off, it's secure. And previously our servers members couldn't access uh, these sites from home. It was restricted because we were protecting them. With NVD anywhere in the seat, uh, anywhere in the world, it's hardened, protected, and it's available. Moreover, all their files, everything they need to work, collaborate, and be the best sailor they can be is right there at their fingertips. And, and that experience that you're getting really doesn't differ whether you're logging into this virtual environment from a government device or a personally owned device, right? It does not. That's the true power. Also from your mobile device or iPad as well. Interesting. So um, let, let's talk about what some of the things that you had to overcome to actually implement this. I, I imagine security policies were probably not quite lined up with what you needed them to be in order to get something as I would say revolutionary as this um, implemented. What were, what were some of the things that you had to get moved around and changed in order to make this work? Well, I can tell you that the, the number one obstacle actually, and, and some of those things we, we approach is trust. Our customers trust in that we are delivering not only a flagship product that is going to deliver the results and and uh, be the state of the market and the things that they expect from you know their personal lives. We also want to um, deliver something that's going to persist. 
So that was our first challenge is because we brought a lot of great things around to the neighbor reserve, but some of those things, they just go away. It happens. So with Nautilus Virtual Desktop, the first thing is trust. Hey, trust us that this is going to be a, a revolutionary product that's going to change the way you drill. Step one. Step two, eliminate as many barriers as possible for adoption. Hey, we want you to use this and we will make it as easy as possible for you to get started. Yeah, talk some more about that. What were some of those early barriers that you had to overcome? Because any organization is going to run into this. It, it'd be good for folks who are thinking about something like this to to hear, uh, you know, how those hurdles uh, get solved. Absolutely. Well, our, our number one uh, hurdle was kind of figuring out, okay, each account represents dollars. How are we going to control this? How are we going to uh, parse it out to our force and make sure that it's going to our neighbor reserve force and kind of track, okay, how much of our force is online, et cetera. And we started with kind of a rudimentary um, process that involved a number of steps. I came in, um, I'm by the way, a reservist who uh, just came on orders here. So I came in with that deck plate knowledge. I was the guy, I was the sailor at the deck plate coming on the drill weekends. And I thought to myself, what's the easiest way for one of my members, one of my sailors to get online and, and to register? And it sent an email. So I immediately came in, we uh, designed an automation that removed all barriers and with a blank email sent to our address, the sailor is signed up and they're good to go with MBD. Um, what, what was user adoption like, especially in, in those early days? Were folks generally excited for something like this? Were they not quite sure what it was? T talk us through that process, Commander. LT, I'll take it from uh, this one. So with this, you know, I think uh, it's the tipping point that we had. I think we had a lot of early adopters who were very much excited, some senior leader members. And then uh, from there, just getting their buy-in to show that, like the lieutenant said, we this is going to be a persistent thing that is benefiting you. So we really did a big role show to all the commanding officers, to what we call our region commanders as well, so they can buy in that. And then Lieutenant Gregory, um, uh, installing the automation piece for it to really cut down all those barriers on installation. Uh, saw our numbers shot up. Um, I think we had a 700% uh, increase within the installation of the automation within the first 90 days. And so we were leading in the entire Navy Reserve uh, for adoption, sir. Obviously, the majority of your users are going to be coming into this from personally owned devices, but I, I wonder if it's also reduce the amount that you have to spend on tech refresh on government owned devices, because really once everybody's using a virtual desktop, I would guess it's less of a demand on the local workstation and it's suddenly not quite as relevant as it might be that you have the newest, shiniest, you know, <clears throat> best processing power right there in the local environment. Am, am I on the right track there? Sir, you are, and I will say what we do is uh, we still have uh, hardware at each Navy Reserve Center just in case a sailor is unable or unwilling to utilize their device for that, but it does cut down on cost, uh, maintaining um, large computer labs, for example, sir. What sorts of, um, get, getting back to sort of the policy changes, were there any sort of explicit exceptions to policy that you all had to get? in order to to start getting this impl uh, implemented either at the dawn level or the, the dod level there absolutely was we the first thing we did is we said you know we're transitioning to this new product this new way of doing business we have to provide some relief because tradition traditionally you have to log on to that local seat that local asset to keep your account alive and active so we first thing we did was we all stopped that periodicity requirement to log in was put on hold and the second piece is that we enabled uh, our warfighters when they log in to be able to reset that periodicity requirement. So um, we really wanted to capture the full experience and meet everything they needed remotely in order to do their job. So that was the, the probably the trickiest bit of policy we had to work on our end uh, to take care of our members. And sir, uh, it was with partnership with PEO Digital and N2 and 6 that this is all possible. Yeah, I, I, and and I imagine there was a cultural aspect to this too, even just within the IT community, because there's been a long discussion over the years about, you know, are we ever going to get to the point where people can access government resources from personally owned devices? And it seemed for a while like, no, that's an impossibility, but you're there now. So how'd you get there? Well, we, we got there because there are some great minds, definitely before my time coming to the seat at PEO Digital 
and other branches said, we need this. And really, um, it kind of started with the CVR environment, which is what we used during the pandemic. Uh, we stood something up, the DOD did very quickly and said, okay, we, we have to make sure that everyone's safe. So we have to provide a product. CVR came out. The result of that success was our flank speed environment, which for the first time, as you mentioned, provided that connection capability from our home in what we would call a flow three connection or personal connection. So that was step one. And step two, thankfully for, for innovators at PO Digital and Commander Greenway and other like-minded individuals, we said, we got to get even better at this. And that's what kind of paved the way for NVD and also uh, MAMWE. You brought up man we let's talk about it because it's directly related to everything we're doing um understand that it, that stands for uh mo i'm gonna screw up the acronym so help you guys stay. Mobile yeah, please. access management without enrollment we like Got our it. acronym here so basically as i understand it this is a way to do essentially everything that we've been talking about except on mobile devices on personally owned mobile devices um how's that going and and, and tell us a little bit more about more about it well, it's another game changer, sir. Uh, with this, it, it allows you, like you said, to take everything, do Teams, use Outlook, so you can send emails from your personal device. Our big belief is we have to focus on the workforce. So that's our fourth pillar we have in the information strategy. And so with that, we have young sailors coming in and we cannot tell them, hey, you can't use your $1,000 device. We want to maximize that ability wherever they are within the, the continental United States or uh, overseas to be able to work on their personal devices and do the Navy Reserve work they need to. And it sounds like it's still for, uh, pretty early days on that. Can you give us a sense of uh, how far into it you are and how far away you are from uh, having it rolled out to the full reserve? So, so uh, we actually, uh, we are still in our second phase of our pilot. So we're not in the enterprise wide rollout. So uh, still getting user feedback on that, but everything so far has been very positive. Um, I was one of the very first users and it made such a difference, you know, regardless if you're a commanding officer to just a junior enlisted. Uh, this can uh, help alleviate some of that pain you have coming in for your drill weekends in advance. And and again, getting back to the security piece of all this, I, I just keep returning to the idea that we had, you know, seven, eight years ago, that this was just an insurmountable security hurdle. What has gotten you to the place where everybody feels like this is something that's not going to pose a serious threat to DOD networks? Honestly, it's industry technology and the state of the market, as I said earlier, is has risen and the DOD has smartly kind of matched that. We've embraced zero trust which is what the rest of the industry is going with um, in our architecture and how we build our networks. We have conditional accesses, which are kind of a first up. And then honestly, there's AI, our favorite buzzword, is out there monitoring our networks autonomously 24 seven and intelligently for the first time. So when an uh, adversary, potential adversary tries to log in with a conditional, conditional access token from some area in the world at a certain time, you know, routes it through, the AI is able to identify that and shut them down. So really, uh, I would love to take the credit, let me tell you, but it's just technology has come so far so fast and AI is really protecting our networks day in and day out. The uh, the WE piece of, of MomWe is, is interesting to me because I, I think basically what that means is that the device can be used to access government resources, even if it's not explicitly enrolled in some, kind of, some type of um, mobile device uh, manager. Um, First of all, is that right? Is that an accurate description of that? And 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 again, how do you do that without compromising security, without having an accurate and, and true understanding and accounting of all the devices out there that are connecting to you? Sure, absolutely. So when I think the role without enrollment, in my mind, what that actually is, is a non what we'd call GFE or government furnished equipment. So previously you would get an iPhone let's say for example, and you'd wipe the whole thing, you would lock it down. And the only purpose of that iPhone would be uh, for government work, official business. So that would be what I call enrolling that phone. That phone is enrolled. What we've done instead is we've said, you know what, for example, again, iPhone, you can completely containerize and separate and virtualize the actual software that's running on the phone, creating a barrier in the software between anything else happening on the phone and what's happening in that container. And that's the, that's the beauty, that's the mobile application management. They're saying, okay, we have it in this beautiful container, it's secure, it's completely separate. There's no data at rest because it's virtual and it's now available without having to say, you know what, let me give up this phone and completely make it for official business only. 
Yeah, and one of the other conversations that's that's gone on around this over the years is, okay, if we let users do this with their personal phones, are there liability issues? Do they have to sign a waiver? It, it, it sounds like you've you've solved all of that with the with the no data at rest factor there. Is that right? Again, I wish I could take the credit, but the uh, the geniuses at PO Digital and Microsoft and other technology leaders they have solved it for us. And again, we're just simply taking advantage um, and really making official business a lot easier for our weekend warriors. So Commander Greenway mentioned that you are still in a pilot phase here. What, what do you feel like you still need to learn to determine before a wider rollout? Different types of phones have different types of software that could be lead to different vulnerabilities. So that's up to, uh, again, the decision makers at Microsoft and, and working with phone manufacturers to say, and device manufacturers to say, hey, what are the limitations? What are the vulnerabilities? And how do we need to accommodate our software for each type of device? Device, Because there's a lot more than just an Android and iPhone nowadays, right? Like 10 years ago, you really had just a couple. And now we just have so many, so many different generations of phones. I mean, iPhone, there's still people using, I think, generation five, and we're on 15. Um, it's pretty incredible. So it's a big task, but they are delivering day in and day out. And we're truly impressed. All right. So, it, I mean, it, at some point here, though, folks are going to have two different options or possibly be able to use both. They're going to be able to access a desktop environment and have a access to mobile apps to get their Navy data and, and, and do Navy things. You have a good sense yet for what that mix is going to be between how much uptake you're going to get on the mobile side versus the desktop side in this, again, unique population, Commander Greenman? Well, I know uh, we're gathering data on that right now, but I was on NBD earlier and MAMWE you know, when, when I was uh, during the day. So it, it helps in both options. And that's where the maximizing the access, depending on where you go. And again, the virtual desktop. And what's wonderful about that is I log off at the Pentagon. And if I had to go somewhere else, I can log on somewhere else, access my virtual desktop just the same. So um, there's a lot of benefits for our sailors who say live in the Midwest and then go to San Diego and have to log into a computer there. The virtual desktop logs on just the same form when they left home. And also staying in the remote access piece, I want to make sure we talk a little bit about the dig digital signature work that you're doing, because that goes hand in hand with with a lot of, of what we've been discussing, eliminating, as you alluded to a little bit earlier, the need to have wet signatures on all, on, on all of these various forms and documents that sailors need to sign. Talk about why that's important and, and fa how far into that project you are. Well, that is important because our, the Chief of Navy Reserve, Vice Admiral John Mustin, one of his North Stars is to mobilize the entire reserve force within 30 days. That's part of Battle Orders 2032 he put out. And to do that, that's going to require a lot of work by a lot of individuals. And so to minimize the amount of sailors having to wet sign everything, but digitally sign, route it, and get that uploaded as quickly as possible. That's the way forward to do the uh, mission of 30 days of uh, mobilizing the entire reserve force. And currently the way that's done, that that is literally a wet signature on a piece of paper that has to get sent somewhere. How does it work now? So a lot, so you can have that option or the other option is uh, the sailor would download the form, sign the form, get saved, um, upload it via an email, and then it would go to the next person, but the next person would not be alerted in their chain of command, but you would have to inform them via an email or text or something. And then the process would continue until the final signature happened. And then it would upload into the appropriate um, website, for example. This may be a dumb question because I'm not even sure it's measurable when you put all these things together. But I, I'm just wondering, is anyone tracking or are there goals set for the sort of efficiency, time, money savings you get out of all of these initiatives? Because it's going to be significant. So that's what we're actually trying to do right now with Navy Reserve Center, Washington, D.C., our largest Navy Reserve Center right now is working with their uh, triad on trying to measure that. What does that look like in a drill weekend? What does that look like throughout the month? How can we actually save that man hours for that very purpose, sir? And on a, a sort of unrelated modernization topic, I know you guys are starting to work on some business process automation uh, across the reserve force. Talk, talk a bit about what you're up to there. Yes, sir. So I'll let Lieutenant Gregory talk about the work he's done. Uh, well, first of all, it was NVD that we helped automate that, but the next part is going to be our government travel credit card. Yes, absolutely. Thrilled to talk about it. So uh, as I mentioned, I was a selected reservist who came on orders and now I'm full time, but I came from the deck plate. And for the last two and a half years, I've kind of have lived a life and I, I know the struggles the that the selected reservists face weekend in and weekend out. So 
my my goal, my overall objective is we have say 12 drill, uh, drill weekends a year. My goal is to reduce administrative overhead totally. So we're not spending six or seven drill weekends or months a year processing paperwork, routing documents to get signed, planning things. Instead, we're reducing that to one or two weekends and the rest of our time is war fighting. Because at the end of the day, the metric I use to measure is win the fight. So when the call comes in 30 days, we're out on the front lines and we're gonna win the fight because we've honed our skills from all, you know, spending all our time preparing to fight and not preparing to route a document to have it signed somewhere. And what specific pieces of that government travel card process are you actually trying to automate? Yeah, absolutely. So the entire DOD has to abide by the rules of the government travel card. And previously, those records are siloed off in the Citibank uh, repository. They own the data, they're the administrator of the card, and they kind of hold the keys to the kingdom. There's a web interface that lets us go in, run reports, and download them. And of course, we have to administer our cards. If someone is delinquent on their government travel card, of course, we have to say, hey, please go pay your bill or, or handle it, correct? So... What we're trying to do is take down the hands of hundreds of people who are, are running those reports and, and checking those things every month and automate it. So the goal is to take five to eight key reports, and I've already got five working now. We have a robot that logs on and downloads those reports for us, taking the work of 160 people spending thousands, thousands of hours a month, downloads it. And then digital automations take over. They send out delinquency notices. They update databases. They uh, alert members. They do all the grunt work that we've been depending on others to do. And in turn, that really frees up a lot of manpower to really take care of our sailors and, again, meet that entire force out of the door in 30 days uh, objective that we have. And you're at the point where you can start to automate any of the, the intercon interconnectivity that's required for this whole process to Citibank, to DFAS, to wherever else, or is this mostly just focused on internal to the reserve, as you said, the, the, the manual labor that goes on on your end. You know, it's funny is I gave a speech yesterday and I had a member from the Coast Guard come up to me and say, hey, how much are you going to charge for this when you're finished? And mm. I said, absolutely nothing. Uh, you're the Coast Guard and we are everyone is along for the ride. Army, Air Force, Marine Corps, anyone who wants to automate GTC as well. We're, we're an open book. We want our partners and we want the entire DOD to uh, succeed just like we are with automation. That's interesting because theoretically it's about the same process for everybody, right? So so once you guys have cracked the nut, it should work roughly the same way everywhere else. We, we are trying to find those big nuggets, like you said, of processes where we can automate. That's, our, that's one of our pillars for our Navy information strategy is that how we modernize some of these processes because our sailors do go uh, to other branches and work with them as well. So whatever we can do to alleviate our uh, sister agencies is uh, one of our priorities. All right. And so any other examples of that come to mind, whether it's, you know, those things that are broadly applicable or, or other things in the area of business process automation? Well, I think uh, the budget is a very popular thing in the legislative and executive branch. So whatever we can do to kind of assist with that, I believe is our going to be our next use case. I'm um, looking at that so we can go into more of the predictive analytics part of that. So we don't have a, right, uh, a rat race to try to figure out what are we going to do at the end of the fiscal year? All right. Uh, before we run out of time, I uh, definitely want to talk about something that's also coming up for you all, which is the Coder Developathon coming up next, or not, I was going to say next April, but it's really next month and just, just a few weeks now. Tell us about that, um, what, what you're trying to do with it. Absolutely. So a uh, bit of a brainchild of mine and uh, Commander Greenway, we're really thrilled about it. The idea is uh, citizen developer. We've heard the word. We know that out there, there are members who have the intellectual curiosity as well as the skills and the desire to kind of get uh, their hands dirty, if you were, you know, if you will, in terms of programming and making things. But how do you reach them? How do you really tap into that potential? So we wanted to give them a stage, show off your work. We're going to bring it to the top, of, to the highest levels, and not only that, we're going to take the best idea. We're going to polish it using some great um, resources we have, like Naval X and their military scrum program. And then we're going to roll it out to the force where it's needed. So if a great idea comes up, say, on a record, a Navy record file, and it's a way to plan out your career um, and make the best moves uh, for you professionally, we would take that, we would make it scalable for the force, and then we'd release it to everyone and say, hey, look at this great thing that someone else did. 
they're a citizen developer. They're not, in a, you know, they're on a payroll part time because they're a reservist. But look at this fantastic product that someone was able to do in their free time just because they had a desire. And guess what? You have those exact tools. Everyone in the Navy has the exact tools right now to do the same level of automation I'm doing. And, and those tools are what? Those are all the power products, um, the Microsoft power products. So part of hmm. our three flank speed, 365, there's a series of power products like power automation, power, power automated, applications, yeah, sure. all those fun things. It's beauty. Thank you, uh, PO Digital. They were able to figure it out. And everyone in the Navy has an E5 license, which gives them access. They can go in and start developing apps and automations today. So that's important, I think, because that means that, that you know, the, the potential participants here are, are not, you know, traditional Navy IT people. The, these sort of low-code, no-code environments lets pretty much anybody with a good idea come up with something. Yes, sir. So we do have a lot of officers and enlisted not in the IT ratings or designators and that we're trying to identify right now that we can showcase, hey, they have a lot of tools. These citizen developers are unique and bring a suite and an arsenal of different things uh, to the table. So how do we uh, harness that is uh, the first step we believe it is this code, build uh, code build-a-thon, sir. All right. How do people participate if they still want to and have managed to not hear of this yet? Anytime they can reach out to me, in fact, and say, hey, you know, what? I have a great idea, Lieutenant Gregory, and I'm going to say, show me. And I am thrilled to empower their idea, uh, give them advice and say, hey, let's move it forward. And then we also have an entire team standing by to execute at ComNav Res 4. You know, we're, we just need the, we can't think of all the ideas ourselves. So we just need the ideas. We need the great work to be shown to us. Hey, this worked for my unit. I can't tell you what every unit needs in terms of power applications or power automations. That's why we picked GTC. It's something that everyone has to have. But these individuals at that deck plate, deck plate level, if they want to bring me their ideas, we'll be happy to take a look at them. In regards to the code developathon this year, uh, my hope was to uh, to get a five minute video, just a rough. Here's what I have so far. Doesn't have to be polished. Like here's a rough demonstration of it basically working and you just email that through DOD safe to code developathon at us.navy.mil. And then we have an alternate address developathon at us.navy.mil. So if you take either of those, that's going to be the way forward. So we're moving past the deadline for this one uh, because we were, we are trying to make this an annual event and build upon this. Um, I, I wanted to get back to the point that uh, Lieutenant Gregory made about being able to scale some of these things, because it seems like that is always a challenge in any government context, especially in DOD when somebody has a good idea. How do you take something when you find a good idea out of one of these things? How do you take it and run with it? Are, are you pre-resourced to be able to, you know, take one of those ideas and build it into something that the entire Navy can use relatively quickly? That's a fantastic question. and something I was actually talking about yesterday. I, I think it depends on the application. You know, we can't just say, hey, you know, for this, for, for all our use cases, I know we love to do this in the military, for all these things under this umbrella, we're going to do it this way. And I think we're kind of, that's where the culture shift and kind of why uh, we jokingly call ourselves IT disruptors. We have to make different approaches. So for the GTC, I'm taking 160 plus processes and things that 160 plus people do and i'm consolidating it where two people are going to do it in one command but conversely with another application it may be the need for us to distribute it all the way to our our deck plate level which is hundreds of nras naval reserve activities so it really depends on the scope of the application i think the bigger thing is as an organization recognizing when we need to be able to flex and not be so rigid when it comes to developing these solutions, rolling them out, and definitely not being afraid to roll them out if they're maybe not 100% uh, proven. Like maybe we just need to get things on the street that work 99.9% .9 of the time so we can have that greater impact on our force. And sir, another thing that we do is we actually work with other Navy organizations through the Navy CIO Council, through N2 and 6 and PEO Digital. So they see the work that we're doing and to be able to scale this to enterprise wide, depending on uh, the amount and where we go from this build-a-thon. Over. All right. It has been a great conversation on IT modernization, Nautilus virtual desktop and beyond with the Navy Reserve. I want to thank our guests, Commander Stevie Greenway, the Navy Reserve Deputy CIO, and Lieutenant Junior Grade Christopher Gregory, Navy Reserve's Command Technology Director. Thank you both very much. Thanks for taking the time. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. I'm Jared Serbu. We'll send it back to the studio for more from the DoD Cloud Exchange.